So I'm just going to go uh, um, provide a little background in who um, the Investing in Student Potential Coalition is for those um, who maybe haven't interacted with us um, that much. Um, uh, so we're um, focusing on designing systems to give every learner what they need when they need it. Um, so what we believe in to, to reach that um, goal is, if you could switch to the next slide, please, yes, um, is working towards um, better accommodating and supporting um, the diverse range of learners and diverse range of student need we have across the state of Washington. And we um, envision this by better designing um, schools so they could meet the needs of students um, and provide accessible and inclusive environments to really better serve all students across the um, across the K-12 system. And our coalition is um, made up of our steering committee, which is made up of the Arc of King County, um, the League of Education Voters, Open Doors for Multicultural Families, Treehouse, as well as the Washington State Charter Schools Association. Um, and then we have a number of individual members and organizations that are also um, members of the ISP coalition um, from across the state of Washington. And we are focused on four main goals within the coalition that we are working towards um, for the state of Washington and all the um, public schools in the state um, is around thriving school communities, um, really working towards schools that really support students so they could truly feel valued, believed in, and seen as they um, experience their education in those settings and where their cultures are, are truly honored and celebrated, um, and they could be active members of their school communities. Um, we also see um, one of our goals as um, environments that are truly designed for every learner to really meet the full range of needs. So whether that be physical, academic, social, emotional, communication, or sensory, to really we design all aspects of the learning environment to really fully engage students and um, create that welcoming and engaging environment to really um, allow them to, to succeed and thrive in, in those settings. Um, our, uh, another goal is around equitable and sufficient resources um, and better supporting um, students um, and making sure their, their um, elements of their IEP are fully fulfilled, that they're fully included and supported across the general education setting. Um, we really need to um, more thoughtful and sufficient and um, substantial resources for education to really meet the full range of needs of students um, uh, across um, the full range of need um, to really have the funding structures and systems that really fully support not only students but educators um, to grow grow their skills and to really provide also the the families um, engagement resources to really include. The, the full the full school school community in this endeavor, uh, as well as around uh, our final goals around successful and meaningful transitions. So as students exit the the K twelve system, that they're really um, working toward on and for the, their the next step in their in their um, work life and educational plans. They're really supported along the way to really achieve their, their post secondary goals um, as they transition out of the K twelve system. So you could follow the information on this page and it'll show you um, how to um, sign up for the coalition or learn more um, and keep track of our work through either um, our website or our Twitter handle at, at and potential. Um, so that's uh, the last of, of my portion for, for at least the early part of this evening. And I will actually pass it to um, Ramona Hattendorf um, from the Arc of King County to um, chat with you a little bit about advocacy. Thank you, um, and I'll pass it to Ramona. Thank you. Hey, everybody. Um, welcome, and thank you for being here. I am putting a link to the presentation. I'll be showing my screen here. I'll have a presentation up on the screen. Uh, but I wanted to make sure some people like to follow along. So there is a link there, and so you can access the slides on your own. And there's a lot of links that are embedded in those slides. So, so there you have it. And now I'm going to hopefully share the correct screen and not give you some sort of personal information on my email uh, from the beginning. Okay, all right. Does it look good, Eric? Look good, Jacob? All right, awesome. Okay, I always check. And, um, and please let me know if I'm speaking a little bit too quickly. 
uh, still always, even after years now, still adjusting to um, uh, interpretation and, and the need to speak a little bit more slowly. Uh, so I'm Ramona Hattendorf, uh, the ARCA King County, uh, we, we support people with intellectual and developmental disabilities. Um, it's across us, well, we concentrate on King County, but we're part of a national um, organization called the ARC that's national and then there's state ARCs and then there's, there's local regional ARCs. And we've been on the steering committee um, since the inception. And one thing that really, you know, speaks near and dear to my heart is that at, a, at its fundamental level, it's around making sure that schools are uh, reflective of and responsive to the people who are actually using the schools, who the, the staff in the schools and the students in the schools. And part of that is having a voice and being willing to listen to the voices of others because you can't have a responsive school system where people don't feel um, welcome and able to speak up. So I'm hoping that in addition to really kind of going over the basis of what is a legislative session all about and how do you talk to a legislator, that you'll also pick up some basic skills that you can use in an IEP meeting um, and really in a lot of different settings. So, so here we are, January 25th, 2002, um, Advocacy Basics. So first of all, <laughs> what's going on right now? So our elected leaders are debating and voting on bills that affect you. And there's really two strategies that you can do right now. You can let your elected officials know what matters to you, and this helps them best represent you. So for instance, some of you are signed up to meet with your legislators, and that is awesome. So what you're gonna to wanna to do is share like what is going on in your life, what it is that you're asking them to do. If there, uh, is there a particular bill that you want them to support, or if maybe there's no bills that, that have speak to you at all, and you wanna share about that. Um, and it's so establishing that connection with your legislator. That, that's one key aspect of um, what's going on and what you can do. Another thing that different advocates are doing right now is they're giving feedback on bills that affect them. And they're giving feedback to the committees who are working on it. And this is also really critical because this helps make sure that public policy is responsive and more effective. In our nation, the concept of public policy, it's not just that it affects the public, is that the public is engaged in the making and the development and the implementation of these policies. This is why our elected bodies, they have to have public hearings. The voting has to be public. There's a, there's a public process embedded into that. And it's not just they need to share with you what they're doing, but they need to make space and invite you into the process so you can let them know, is this a good policy? Does this make sense? So in today's presentation, the kind of sharing, you can use the same set of skills for both scenarios. So we'll be sharing a little bit about uh, a standard way of going around messaging for your legislator. You can use the same strategies and the same technique for giving feedback on bills that, are, that they're hearing and they're working on right now. I'll go into these details a little bit more, the next slides, but just as an overview, how can you even reach the legislators? Well, you can call them, you can email, them, you can set up a meeting, you can give public testimony. There is a legislative hotline and that is here. You can find your legislators and your legislative district at the link provided there. Uh, if you click on it, a form pops up and you put in your home address and then you get two choices. You can click on congressional, and that'll give you your federal leaders. Or you can click on legislative and that will give you your state leaders. And if you aren't aware, federal is like your House of Representatives, your US Senator, which is Patty Murray or Maria Cantwell. They don't have anything to do with what the state legislator does. And what the state legislator does doesn't have anything to do with what Congress does at the federal level. They're completely different. It's the same thing that the state legislator while they might sometimes give direction to local governments, they really don't get in and they can't tell your local city council what to do. They might pass laws that affect the kinds of taxes they can pass, but they aren't going to intercede on a local level on a lot of things. So if you go to that, if you go to that link, you can find out who your legislators are. There's also, in case you wanted to uh, find a legislator who's not necessarily your own, all legislators 
In fact, everybody at the, legis at the legislator, the employees, the staff, they follow a protocol that goes first name dot last name at ledge.law.gov. There's also a link here for committee agendas. And this is actually will take you to the main page of the website. And every day, if you click on that, they'll show you today's agenda. But if you click it, it's a drop down. You can collect, you can set, excuse me, you can pick one of the other dates that they have um, committee meetings for. Uh, right now, they're going about a week in advance. And so you can see what, what are these committees? What are they talking about? What bills are they hearing? And that's just a really good way to get a feel for the kinds of issues that they're talking about. And then again, we'll go into this a little bit later, but on a, the sign-in. So this is if there was a bill and you did want to comment on it, there's a way that you can sign in and, and the, the, the link is there at the bottom. And CSI just stands for Committee Sign In. And if you click there, you can figure out, do I need to talk to the House? Do I need to talk to the Senate? Um, you will need to know things like what committee you want to talk to and what the bill is. Um, so you are going to want some information. But the point of that is that there are various ways to get information. I also want to pause here for a second. I, the way I have my screen set up is I, I don't have chat. Um, so uh, Eric or Jacob, if there's a question, if you guys just want to flag it for me and let me know, feel free to interrupt me. Um, I'm happy to pause at any time and answer a question. So today we're going to give you an overview of what's going on, and we're going to provide tips to help you write a message. So what happens in the legislative session? I don't know if any of you are familiar with it. There's actually a pretty good um, old, uh, I think they were called the School of Rock series from the 1970s, How a Bill Becomes a Law. It's actually pretty accurate, though it's very, very, very dated um, uh, depiction. But it's a bit like a board game and it's a bit like a race. So bills are introduced, they're debated, and they're voted on. And a bill, that is just a proposal to change state law or spend state money. And they have to go through a lot of different gatekeepers. They need to go through a policy committee and they're gonna hear and they're gonna assess this bill. Is it a good bill? Does it make sense? Would this, would this improve something for somebody in the state? You have a fiscal committee. And these are a committee, it's in the House, it's called Appropriation. and the Senate, it's called Ways and Mean. And your fiscal committee will look at the bill and they'll look at, okay, so how much is it gonna cost? Do we have money for that? Does it make fiscal sense? Like, is this a really good investment um, for the state to make? So they will also evaluate this bill with a slightly different lens. And then there's something called rules, which is, completely different. A lot of people don't even necessarily know about rules. Rules is a committee. And in the Senate, it's pretty open. Um, I think you can even watch the rules hearings in the Senate, but they will release. And what happens, well, what happens in a rules committee is a group of people, they meet, and then they decide which bills are going to be sent to the chamber for a full vote. And in the Senate, they'll tell you, they'll say, Senator X chose this bill to send to the floor. So you can actually kind of track it. In the House, it's more secretive. Um, you just know that the House met and they chose these bills to send to the Senate floor. But all these different, different points in the process are different hurdles that a bill needs to get through. And not every bill will go through these different committees. Not every bill that, the, that is referred to the policy committee will even get a hearing. Um, it really depends on how many bills are introduced that session. Um, and what is the demand on their time. But generally, there's, there's usually a, a very, very good number of bills that they don't even get a hearing. So that's the first challenge. Is this bill even going to get a hearing? And then if it does get a hearing, it's not necessarily going to be acted on by the committee. Uh, they're going to want to make sure it's a really viable bill. Like, is this something that a lot of people agree on? Is it is it maybe a good idea, but it's not fleshed out enough, but maybe we'll take it up next year? Um, is there a lot of opposition? Is it just too much of a headache? Um, or is it really, really popular and a lot of people want this? So there's a lot of advocacy that goes into getting a bill into a public policy hearing. And then there's a lot of advocacy in getting the bill out of the policy committee. And that they have an expression for that called executive action. 
If the bill is going to cost money, it goes to the fiscal committee, and some bills don't, and so they go straight to rules. But it's the same thing then in, in the in the fiscal committee. So say a bill is referred to appropriations, it may or it may not be heard. If it is heard, it may or it may not be acted on. And a lot of power actually falls to the chairs of these committees. So something to keep in mind. And then again, as I mentioned earlier, then you have the rules committee and they actually decide which bills then will go to the full chamber for a vote. And even when they pull a bill and send it to the full chamber of the vote, there's a clock ticking. The, the legislator only needs for a set number of days and not all bills always get voted on. Usually if they get sent to the chamber, they're gonna get voted on, but sometimes the clock runs out and they don't. And also something to keep in mind, especially if you're curious about how to testify to a committee, is that most bills are gonna be amended in the process. It is really unusual for a bill to go entirely through the process without changes happening to it. So that's something to be expected. And if there is a bill that really speaks to you or that you really care about, you need to follow it because some of these amendments may be really great and they may improve things. And some of them you may think undermine the bill. Bills can be changed dramatically. So it's important to understand that they evolve, they change. And so you're going to see how they evolve and change. And there's a way to do that. Um, all the bills have their own page on the website and they track all that for you. And also, and this is the big thing, is that after they go through all those policy and the fiscal committee and the rules committee, they need to, and then they actually pass out of the chamber, they need to go to the other chamber and they need to do the whole thing over again. So if a bill, it's a house bill, it goes through the house, it needs to go to the Senate. The Senate bill, and it passes to the Senate and needs to go to the House. And then after it passes both, the bills, they have to line like what they passed. And so if the House made a lot of changes to the Senate bill, they have to send it back to the Senate and say, hey, do you agree with this? And there has to be another vote on yay or nay, do they agree on it? And if they can't agree on it, then they might meet and talk it out and see if they can figure out what they can agree on. So a lot of, a lot of different steps in the bill process. Oh, and then at the very end, the governor signs the bill. And yes, the governor does have veto power. So this is what's going on. You got committees meeting, you've got chairs, you have legislators who are dropping bills and are hoping they'll get heard. Uh, you have uh, the threat of it got heard, but will it pass out of committee? There's always this fear of like, oh no, what's the fiscal note? Is this gonna be considered too expensive? And when, so will that mean the appropriations committee maybe won't listen to my bill or won't pass it out. Um, there's a lot of different things that are going on in the legislative session. And some advocacy takeaways is that certain leaders have more power in this process. People in the rules committee, they have a lot of power. Your, uh, your caucus leaders, there's a Democratic caucus and there's a Republican caucus in each of the chambers. Uh, they're going to have some influence because they might be able to influence which bills actually get the order they get called on to a vote on the House floor. So they have power. And um, something else to keep in mind is that the legislators, they're not usually policy experts on the issues they vote on. They may be experts in one matter, like say they have a background in environment and they sit on the environment committee. And so they may know a lot of policy about environment, but they're going to be voting on education bills. They're gonna be voting on health and housing bills. And so they don't necessarily have an ingrained expertise. So our system relies on advocates to inform them. And another strategy or something to consider with an advocacy takeaway is that advocates who can reach more legislators with a compelling and a consistent message often have a better chance of influencing the process. Because you need to listen to, you need to be able to reach a lot of different gatekeepers and you need to be able to um, have them hear your urgency, realize that there's something fixable here and that they can act on it and they can actually help solve this problem. And you're going to need that happening in a lot of different fronts, two different chambers, a lot of different committees, and among people who might have different priorities of their own. So coordinated messaging, when possible, is something that's really effective. And I'm going to pause here for a second just to see if there's any questions 
on the process. Okay, it does not sound like there are. All right, so to reach the committee, again, I gave you some more links on this slide. There's the committee agendas, which is the main page of the state legislative site. There's the committee sign-in. And uh, the best option to testify, uh, you can do so during the hearing or you can send in written testimony. You can also state your position for the record. And I'm gonna show you that here. So if you were gonna go, this is just a photo, by the way, this isn't the actual website. But if you did want to engage in the policy making process, not just establishing a relationship with your legislator, but the actual writing of policy process, you would go to the committee sign in page. And on this example, I clicked on House Bill, HV stands for House Bill, SB would stand for Senate Bill, House Bill 1900, schools discrimination. And when I clicked on that, you have options. I would like to testify remotely. What this means is that every, everyone this session is testifying remotely because they're doing it on live. But this means that you actually wanna participate in that meeting. So if you signed up for there, a form comes up, you state whether it's your pro, your con or your other, you put in your, your name and your address, your phone number, and they're gonna want all this information. And just so you know, this is part of the public record. So that does become public information. And that's something that maybe some people do or don't want, but you should know it's public information. You fill out that and then you sign up and you're basically saying that, please call on me. I would like to address this committee. And not in person, cause it's through Zoom, but, but live during the meeting. And then they send you a link and you click on that link. And then when they call you up, uh, they send you another little invitation to join as a panelist. You click a button and then you can unmute yourself and put yourself on camera and you speak. Oh. So those of you who are familiar with Zoom, you would be very familiar with the process. If you're not familiar with Zoom, you will become familiar with the process after you do it the first time. So that's one way you can actually speak live during the committee hearing. They don't guarantee that you can speak, but, um, but they try to get people in. You can also, and this is a really easy, quick and easy way for people to sort of register what their, what their opinion is. And I've seen coalitions use this technique with uh, really well, is that you can just state your position for the record. So if you clicked on that option, a form would come up, it's very similar to the other one, you fill out your information. But on this one, all you're doing is for the public record, you would be saying, in my case, Ramona Hattendorf of the Arca King County supports this bill. Or Ramona Hattendorf with the Arca King County does not support this bill or has concerns. And that goes, becomes part of the public record for this bill. The third option is you can submit written testimony. And by the way, with that one, if you have, say you have some sort of materials that you wanna share with committee members, there's actually an option on that one where you can upload materials. For parents, something I've seen parents in uh, not necessarily Zoom testimony, but in the old fashioned days when we could still have access to Olympia, they would go and they would take one pagers of their child or their student and they would show them. So make sure they understood like, I'm here, I'm talking about Sandy, this is Sandy. They would, they, would, they would have these great one pagers. Well, if you wanted to provide written testimony and wanted to make sure it was personal and they realized who this policy was impacting, you could upload that one pager. Or maybe you're an advocate as part of a larger coalition like Investing in Student Potential, or there's a lot of different coalitions out there. And they had a bill with talking points and you wanted to share those talking points, or maybe they had some research, you could upload that. So that's another really good option. Hey, Ramona, this is Eric. Uh, there is a question in the chat for you, which is, would you explain in, in this format why you support or do not support the bill? Um, so if you wanted to explain, you would need to do it in written testimony or live testimony. When you are just noting your position, you're not given the option to explain. Is, does that answer the question?
I'll watch the chat and let you know. Okay. All right. Yes, it, it does answer the question. Thank okay. you. Yeah, you're very welcome. And you can also just say you have concerns too. And just so you know, when a bill is heard, when you go to a bill page, you actually have the text of the bill, which can be kind of confusing to read until you're really familiar with them. And then they also have the bill report and bill analysis. And those are ones that staff puts together. And so they don't use all the lingual language. Actually, they just sort of summarize. You got, these are the high points of what the bill does. They give you a little bit of history and background about what this is about. They're very, very helpful. And as the bill goes through the process, they capture who is weighing in. And that can also be very helpful for legislators because they can look at that and they can see at a glance, oh, this group, this group, this group, they liked it, this group didn't. And it helps inform them of maybe who's supporting it, who isn't. And they also give them a, a, a brief summary of what some of the pro positions were and what some of the worries or concerns were. So it's, it documents the public input. And so again, on, on the committee, when you're testifying to committee, it's all part of the public record and they will capture uh, the, the live testimony that happens. They will capture the, um, the weighing in yes or no. They don't capture, they don't offer synopsis of written testimony in those reports, but the written testimony is available to the, all the legislators on the committee. In fact, I was also told by one of the legislators, any legislator can look it up. So they can go into the official record of the bill and they can open it up and they can read all of the testimony uh, that was provided. So they're informed when they're making their decision. And just also, I wanted to give you guys a heads up. If you do do this, you don't have very much time to speak. The usual rule of thumb used to be prepare for a couple of minutes, but I, more often than not, I've been hearing 60 seconds. The long times have been 90 seconds. So if you do want to speak, you need to have very brief statements. And then I would follow up with written testimony that really expands on what you want to say or expands on some of the detail. And I wouldn't try to just cram two minutes or 90 seconds into 60 minutes because it just doesn't work. They're hearing, legislators are sitting in these hearings for hours during a day. They might be hearing hundreds of people testify during the day. And it really works better in live testimony to just pick one thing, make it clear, and then wrap it up. And if you have additional points, then follow up because it's just, it's, they're not going to hear it. Or they might hear it, but they aren't really going to retain it. So really staying focused is important. All right, and so that is the end of kind of like what's going on in the legislature. So those of you who have appointments, this is all going to be going on to the back of mind. And when you and when you do sit down and you speak, either with your legislators or staff members, a lot of times they're going to want to know: is there a bill about that? So I really would advise you, and there's a link to a bill tracker. The League of Education Voters has a great bill tracker on education bills. Um, and there's other ones out there. I would really advise you to kind of look through those bill trackers and see if there is a bill that speaks to it. Because that's what they're gonna wanna know. It's like, is there a bill or is there something that you want my legislator to do? Because at this point, it's kind of too late in the process right now for them to, draw, to write up a new bill and drop it for this legislative session, but they can vote or they can amend something that's currently in play. If there isn't any bill, that's fine. Just let them know there isn't any bill. And honestly, I'm kind of concerned about that. And then you can launch into your story and you can actually ask them if they would stay engaged with you because maybe they could help introduce a bill next session that would speak to your concerns. So now I'm gonna transition into the message writing component of this. Ah, thank you, Eric, you put in that, the bill tracker information. So on them, so how to reach your reps. So again, there's a hotline, so you can call them. You can call that hotline and they will take your information and then they, they send it out to your people. So you can just say, hey, I like this, I don't like this. A lot of people like to use the hotline when they're actually voting because they may their staff may not have time to wade through a lot of emails, but if they have a log that, oh my goodness, 50 people just called in, that's gonna be something that captures their eye. They're gonna say that there's a big constituency. There are a lot of people who care about this. So a lot, you can use the hotline for any reason, but that's a lot of times 
It's people use it because they're actually voting on something and it's a way for let, it has more immediacy to it. You can also find your legislators and legislative district again through the website and you can email them directly. And if you know what your bill is on the bill number, I'll, I'll show you a little bit later, but there's actually a button you can click and you can send a message directly to your legislators about that bill. So this is an example of the bill page. And my big yellow swish here, there's, there's buttons, there's comments on this bill. If you click there, a form comes up and it lists who your legislators are for your district. And you can send it to all of them. You can send it to one. You have three. You have one senator and you have two representatives at the state level. Uh, you can also get email notifications. So that's why bill trackers are really good because they will share that bill number. And when you click on that, um, if you were to go further down, you could see when the bill was heard, when the committee is gonna make decisions about it, all of that is tracked, it's all on the bill page. So these are really, really handy to have. So on messaging basics, you're gonna to wanna to keep it personal. Personal stores really, really, I can't emphasize that enough, have the most impact. A lot of people wonder about data or research. You know, if you have one really strong point, please do use it and you can use your story to illustrate it. But if you just have like a first meeting, maybe just keep it to that one. And especially if you're testifying, just keep it to the one. Once you have a dialogue with your legislator or their staff, then you can share more. You can go back and forth, you can follow it up. Um, and you can also wanna make sure that you're connecting your story with an action that they can take. So you share something and then you have a specific ask. Will you vote for this bill? Or I'm concerned this bill won't get a hearing. Could you please talk it up in caucus? Something like that. And so a clear, simple message, and this one is really basic, it's kind of obvious. But honestly, if you just follow these fives, you're gonna have the basic outline for a message. This can be a short message that you use in testimony. It can be a little bit longer message if you wanted to write a letter. It could also be uh, an outline that you can create to help you when you meet with your legislators. So the first is, who are you? Obviously your name. Um, in this scenario, maybe your legislative district, your neighborhood, your town. Um, if it is about education, you might want to share what school or do you homeschool, uh, what's your situation. If it's appropriate, you might want to share your group affiliations. If you're representing them or if the group affiliations or just they really frame the advocacy um, that you're the reason why you're there, then that would be appropriate. Uh, but you certainly don't have to have a group. You're there. The legislators want to know you, you're consistent. You're, excuse me, you are their constituent and they want to get to know who you are personally. The next is what is your issue? Describe it. What is it that you're worried about? are happy about, and you can use simple language. In fact, it's good to use simple language. Again, during the legislative session, you meet a lot of people. If you have a meeting, by the time greetings are taken care of, you have maybe 10 minutes to talk to them. So you wanna keep it pretty simple. If it's, a, if it's a hearing on a bill, again, you might only have 60 seconds. So using simple language that they can retain is really good. Um, for those of you who have heard, some of you may have heard of plain language, there's another technique called um, Easy Read. And if you Google Easy Read, they can give you samples of how to use Easy Read. That would be a great way to do your messaging because it's clear, it's direct, it's actually designed for people to be able to take it in cognitively and have a picture in their mind. So there's, there's ways of keeping it simple that really help them understand and remember your message. It's going to be critical that you go over why this matters to you. How will it change your life? How will it change somebody else's life? And this is where the personal story comes in. And you also want to make the connection of this is why I care. This is why it's important to me personally. Um, but this is why you need to care. Is it happening in their community? Does it affect them personally? Does it affect somebody they know? Is it expensive? Is it cause harm? Is, it, is there something bad happening that they need to fix? 
or is there something good that if they put a little investment in it can make a world of difference? Um, but you wanna make sure you hit upon why it is the person you're talking to, why they should care about this, why they need to care about this. And then they ask, you know, what, and, and specifically do you want them to do? If it's about passing a bill out of committee, you know, you'll vote on this bill, um, but you do want to be specific. If you just meet and you share your concern and you don't really have an ask, then you're, you're, you're giving them something to consider and it will probably help them realize um, the different types of need in the community that they need to be aware of, but they don't necessarily have direction and they may not necessarily do what you want or assume they're gonna do with that information. So it's pretty important to have a specific ask for them. This is an example, we won't go into it now. Those of you who want, you have the link and go in and read in this. This is an example of taking a testimony. This was one that was used earlier this week or a plug it in, like who, who am I? Um, what is the issue? Why? why I care about this. In this case, this was live testimony. Why should the audience care about this? And what action am I asking them to happen? With this one, I was testifying on behalf of my organization. So this one didn't get personal. And that's another reason why you and your story are so important. Because somebody who is representing an organization is going to be going more into the research. They're gonna be going more into the data. They're gonna be more like a, this is what we're hearing from the people we support, but they aren't gonna have that story that really captures the heart. They aren't gonna have that insight that helps them really, really get an example of how this is playing out in people's lives. And then as an example, in that particular hearing, I went in prepared for 90 seconds. And then they said, oh, guess what? We're only going to have 60 seconds. So, so many people signed up. So I edited it, it down. I still kept some high points, but I took some of the details out. And then I followed up with written testimony so that they could get some of those details. And a question a lot of people have is what if they disagree? Because they aren't always going to agree with you. And so in response, I would say sometimes the best action is to keep a dialogue. You know, ask if they'd be willing to read some supporting materials, get a follow up meeting. After session, ask and say, hey, could we meet for coffee sometime? Um, I'd like to share more information. I'd like to explain why this is important to me. Or, hey, would you be willing to meet a group of parents who have such and such, you know, to share with you? Just establish the relationship and keep it going. And there's also other ways and places to share your message. Uh, at town halls, that's great showing up there. There's different um, candidates when people are running for um, a great time actually is when people are running for office is to go to those candidate forums, get to know them, share your story, establish a relationship before they're even to office or at least get it on the radar. This is an issue that you know they need to be responsive to if they're elected. You can invite legislators to meet with your group you can follow them on social media. That's a really good strategy. I've seen a lot of people use effectively. You can share your advocacy work on social media. Again, ledge.law.gov. This is, this is the state legislator's website. And this is where you can look up your representatives, you can senators, you can go in there, you can click on them. You can see what bills, you can see their biography. What have they sponsored? What are they working on? What committees? In addition to their contact information. And then these are the education committees. All the committee information is on the website, uh, but since we're investing in student potential, there's a house education committee. There's a children, youth and families and there on the house side, that's where your early learning stuff is gonna be in children, youth and families. On the Senate side, they, they share them. They have one committee that looks at both early learning and K-12. And thank you, Eric, for posting those links in the chat as well. Uh, Jake, Jacob is going to go over the platform next, but I put a summary on the presentation for you. What we really care about, investing in student potentials around family engagement and partnership. You got to have that if you're going to make an IEP work. You got to have that if you're going to have responsive schools. 
professional development and training. Got to have that if you're going to have inclusive practices. Mental health behavior and supports and social emotional learning and funding structures. But again, Jacob will go into those next. And then just so you know, and I think uh, Eric probably put into the chat, if he hasn't already, I know he's about to. Um, that's where, this is the bill tracker. That's where you can find those bills. And I would really encourage you to click on one of those bills and just get a sense of, you know, what that bill page is, because uh, that's really going to help you. You can click on the comment, comment on this bill, and now go directly to your legislators. If you look about where it's going to be heard next, you can actually go and you can either just watch that meeting. They also have links on there to TVW or YouTube recordings. Everything is recorded. Again, public, 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 public policy, public hearings, it's all public. So it's all recorded. So you can watch, you can hear what other people are saying. And I'm going to stop my share. And I am done with the formal presentation part of it. And if you have any questions, I'm happy to give any uh, tips or advice. I've been in this field of, well, I've been in field of communications for, I don't know, way too many years. I'm in my mid fifties now. I can get you beat, Eric. Uh, so 30 years, at least in communications, but I've been doing um, uh, policy and communication and really especially working with families for, I think 10 years now. I think I started this professionally in 2012. Um, so a lot of different stories and offline, if there's anything in particular you're wondering, like I care about this issue, I don't really know if there's a bill about it, you can reach me offline. I'll, I'll, in a minute here, I'll put in my address. I'm happy to look up a bill for you, or I'm happy to do some research to find out if there's anything that you might want to have on your radar that you can use as a, as a starting off point um, when you meet with legislators. And thank you for your time. Um, thank you so much, Ramona. Um, and just one more quick thing to add um, on the bill pages. Um, one thing that I've found very helpful over the years are the, which Ramona mentioned, were the bill reports. And oftentimes when a bill um, is first um, introduced and gets put in, in the system and it's on the website, it can take them sometimes a little while to actually put up the bill report. So you, you might check for the first few days after a bill is dropped or introduced, and it's not gonna be on there, but eventually it will be on there. Um, and that has a lot, a lot of really rich information oftentimes um, of not just what the changes are, but what kind of a little bit of the context is. To, um, so you can kind of better understand what they're trying to do. Cause I've been doing this a number of years now too. Um, and often you read bills and at first, read it's just a bunch of gibberish it's, it's kind of hard to kind of make it out um until you kind of start unpacking um a few different things and then it kind of starts to paint a little picture um so um the bill report is a good way to kind of um kind of verify your understanding as you read the actual bill language so um that's been an inv invaluable tool for, for me so um i would highly recommend using that as a, as a good resource to kind of um just kind of brush up on something that you might have heard about. Um, and uh, once again, thank you so much, Ramona, for, for sharing. Um, and uh, so right now, me and uh, my colleague, uh, Ellie, um, will be sharing uh, a little bit about our, um, excuse me, our legislative priorities for um this um legislative session um so this is obviously the 2022 legislative session um and so we're just going to kind of share with you the, the priorities that that we have the session um in um not go super deep into them but then leave some time for folks to ask questions about the priorities share about the priorities um or ask any uh questions around um, any bills folks might have heard um, that you um, uh, want a little more information on that we could potentially provide, uh, no guarantees. Um, uh, so uh, to kind of start things off, I will pass it to my colleague uh, Ellie Bridges, and she'll share a little bit about um, this first area on our priorities. Hi, everybody. Uh, 
I'm Ellie, uh, she, her pronouns, policy analyst at League of Education Voters and uh, a member of the Investing in Student Potential Coalition. Um, thanks for being here and great to see some familiar faces. Um, before I dive into the buckets uh, on our legislative platform for the coalition, um, just want to acknowledge that a lot of them came from you. Um, we held listening sessions uh, earlier in the fall um, and really like dug into the priorities that folks brought up there. Many of you parents of kids with disabilities, but also other stakeholders. Um, and so we hope that this is a reflection of some of the needs that you've brought forward to us and that we with you can bring towards uh, Olympia. Um, so there's four main buckets. I'm gonna talk about the, the first two here. Um, the first one being meaningful family engagement and partnership. Um, we overwhelmingly hear that parents, caregivers, um, want to be able to work in collaboration with teachers and not against them. Um, but speaking up for your child um, and really advocating and being there for your, your child can make you feel like a burden uh, on school staff um, rather than an essential partner um, in supporting your child inside and out of, out of the classroom. Um, and then this is especially challenging among Black, Indigenous, and other families um, of color who have students with disabilities and those who speak languages other than English. Um, so recognizing parents as partners uh, means ensuring that they understand the resources in front of them and available to them, um, and also understand and are supported in navigating the complex K-12 system. Um, so one key action area related to this during session is around language access um, and access to qualified interpreters. Um, this is a priority across uh, public education and there's a bill related to that uh, being heard this session, um, but it's especially important for people in the special education system um, as there's so much complex information um, and IEP meetings and family communication, it's essential for that. Um, the other sort of action priority in this bucket is around IEP meetings themselves, um, which we've heard can feel disempowering um, because there are so many rules, there's so many complex documents that are presented to parents and caregivers um, in the moment um, and not always enough time to process them um, and they're not always translated in the language, the preferred home language of that parent or family member. Um, so ensuring timely accommodation and support for IEP meetings to parents, families, and caregivers is another key action area of ours uh, during this session. Um, and then finally, um, and relatedly, it, is very important that teachers, educators, um, and other school staff have training, experience, and resources so that they are on the same page as parents, caregivers, and uh, advocates on supporting students with disabilities and advocating for them to get what they need. Um, overall, more training and emphasis on um, on teachers being able to recognize and combat ableism and its intersections with racism um, is another priority that we heard in our listening sessions um, and that we are prioritizing this session as well. Um, so we can move to the next bucket. Uh, uh, and this bucket is very related to the last sort of action point that I was just talking about. Um, but another area of ours on our platform is professional development training and technical assistance for school staff. Um, training and professional learning, uh, many parents and caregivers see that as a necessary tool for disrupting ableism and racism and promoting greater equity in our schools. Um, it will help create a culture of belonging overall for all students, um, but also just ensure that every educator has the skills needed to meet the needs of students who are most often excluded by our school systems. 
Um, in particular, there's a huge need for ongoing learning and assistance and implementation around UDL, Universal Design for Learning, um, and practicing cultural responsiveness at school at the same time. Um, so really focused on the intersections of ableism and racism in how students' needs are met in school. So we're supportive of UDL training as well as ongoing uh, DEI, diversity, equity, and inclusion um, trainings for school staff and educators as well. Thank you, Ellie. Um, so this next area, the third bucket of our legislative platform for this, this year is around um, mental health, um, behavior supports, um, and meeting the social and emotional needs of students. This was, um, I think, pretty clearly from our listening sessions and from a lot of the other work we've done um, over the last year plus um, has been by far the, the most pressing need and priority from a lot of families. Um, uh, across the state. Um, so this is one, one of our areas of focus, and this includes um, making sure that we are able to provide um, students and staff access to the necessary mental health supports and services um, to really um, meet the, the growing mental health um, and uh, social emotional wellness crisis that our, our schools, um, our students are experiencing right now. So making sure that um, districts are resourced um, adequately, but also the uh, kind of segueing into the earlier priority around um, professional learning and technical assistance, all this is linked together. Um, and we need to make sure that we not only provide the, the staffing resources, but also to make sure that those staff have the necessary um, knowledge and skills to really meaningfully meet the need of students um, as they're going through these um, crisis, crises or having these additional needs um, to be met. And, uh, and that um, with the, another area is around the vetted curriculum options for trauma-informed de-escalation training um, uh, to, to really, um, uh, we, we think this can be a, a valuable piece in really de-escalating um, situations to, um, that might contribute to discipline um, instances or harmful um, traumatic experiences for students, and also is a contributor to the um, to the school to prison pipeline. So what we want to um, do is making sure that kind of making sure we have um, districts and schools and staff are really um, positioned in a, in a way to really be able to meaningfully meet the needs of students and do it in a way that um, is trauma informed and really de escalates these um, uh, provides de escalation training to really um, limit the um, uh, the use of discipline um, options or um, how those might um, negatively impact kids, um, both from an emotional standpoint, but also from uh, actually being in a in a classroom or in a school standpoint as well. And this third the third area within this bucket is um, really trying to create these. Um, districts and, and schools that have a positive um, school and classroom climate um, kind of going back to one of our goals as a coalition um, is really creating um, cultivating these spaces in schools that really support the full range of needs of students and makes them feel belonged uh, like they belong in the school building um, like they're valued um, like um, they're really welcome in the space and they can be themselves so really providing the the supports, the structures, and the scaffolding to, to students and the and the staff um, to really be able to create these school climates and the classroom climates to really um, position students in, um, in a way that could really um, help them better engage in school and be supported, um, so that um, the school can be a, a welcoming, well, a welcoming, comfortable place for them um, as they engage in their academic uh, pursuits. Our final area is around um, establishing funding structures that are truly centered on student need. Um, so we want to make sure students, um, as they are trying to access these services and support the, the full the IEP to meaningfully access and engage in their education, um, or to even have the 
transportation um, ability um, ability to transport themselves to and from school, um, should there be barriers or challenges, that all these areas really need to be resourced in a way that really meets, fully meets the district needs for these um, in order to fully support their students. Um, because right now we're not resourcing schools uh, adequately enough to really meet the needs of students. Um, so in some cases, students are, are going without the services that they, that they should be getting, or um, it relies on a system uh, of schools using local levy funds um, to kind of backfill the lack of state funding for special education. Um, so then that creates um, inequity in school. Some districts that might have more levy funding available can maybe fill, um, fill in some of the gaps from state funding, but the districts that don't have access to those funds aren't able, don't have that same luxury of using local funds to, to kind of backfill where um, the state has fallen short. Um, so that creates significant inequities based on geography. And one of the other, the last area is removing um, what's often called the funded enrollment cap. Um, and what that is, is uh, districts are limited um, in how much they're provided funds for students um, who have IEPs that um, they'll only, the state will only um, pay for up to 13.5% of student enrollment um, to provide special education funding for their students. So what that effectively means is if a student, if a district has 13 point, 13% of their students receive special education services, those will all be fully funded according to the, the state funding formula. But if a district has above 15%, so 15 or 16 or, or even higher percent of their students enrolled in special education, um, whatever percent of students is above 13.5, they'll still get services from the district, from, from the schools, but they won't be providing in a, any additional funding for that percentage of students above 13.5%. Um, so that means you have to spread that um, the, the other funding across more students, um, which just may, means every all students um, in that district with a higher enrollment for students um, receiving special education services um, is just, it's less, less funding to go around. So you get less funding per student, um, which creates significant equities, especially for um, oftentimes smaller districts. Um, so this is the last of our lead priorities.